Hello, everybody. Today, I am joined by Angie Monko. Welcome, Angie. Thank you. Angie is a life coach and the um, founder of Harmony Harbor Coaching. And you really specialize in coaching for intuitive women leaders, which is very awesome. (laughs) And we're going to talk about the work that you do today, but also your personal relationship and journey with grief and I know that um your grief story started actually when you were very young um Mm -hmm. with the death of your aunt and yeah I read that on your on your website but also you're a bereaved mother of mad yeah so perhaps maybe you want to um begin with sharing about Maddie and how those first few years were for you after sure. died. Well, thank you for having me, Tara. Um, I will just give a little bit of background with my auntie Lane. When I was six years old, I lost her and we happened to share the same birthday. So September 23rd, we were both born. She was 10 years older than me. And so she ended up, we were best friends and she took me places to eat. And I, I, um, hung out with her and her boyfriend. And, and so that was my auntie Lane. And she was the fourth child of my grandparents. They had three boys and then Elaine. So they were holding out for that girl. And so she was the apple of their eye and so forth. And she developed a tumor in her, in her lung area, the size of a watermelon, they said. And it just grew very quickly. And within two weeks, she was gone. She was 16. And and so going through that experience with my caregivers, who are my grandparents, was, you know, I absorbed a lot of that, that grief, you could say. And it just, I, I saw how they were hurt. And I saw, I went to the funeral and no one was talking to me. And, and so when, when they're all in their pain and suffering, it's hard to focus on the children a lot of times. And so I just, that made an imprint for me. Plus, and I don't think I, not a lot of people know this when about two weeks, three weeks, maybe a month before she died, I was sitting in the back seat of a car and Elaine and her boyfriend were up front and they were wanting to be alone, kiss, you know, that kind of thing, make out. And, and I was in the back seat, And so Elaine said, Hey, Angie, would you just go inside, you know, go in the house? And I'm like, no, I don't want to. And she, so she got more insistent, you know, like you need to go inside. We want time alone. And, and I said, no, I don't want to. I was really indignant. And, and then she said it again. And then I said, well, I hate you. And I hope you die like that. And I went inside, you know, but I realized that that created this imprint in me that, and I just really just processed this more recently that, well, if I want something, my desires are bad because I'm really powerful in my mind. I'm like, oh my gosh, I said that to her and she died a few weeks later, you know, and it was a blindside death. And so it created this association in my mind that I better not ask I better not be too greedy or, or selfish or ask for what I want because my my desires are not healthy and they're going to hurt people. Mm-hmm. So you know how kids think. We don't have a filter. I was I was six years old. So 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 that I wanted to share because that did form my this this almost an aura around me of grief on some level and watching my daytime caregivers go through that loss. Mm-hmm. So. So there's that. And, and then fast forward to, um, I had a daughter, Maddie in 1996. And four days later, we learned that Maddie had cystic fibrosis. And so that affects the lungs and the digestion and, and so forth. And so that was really hard. That was a grieving of what's going to come of this, you know, because we didn't know anything about CF. We didn't know we were carriers of this gene. And, um, so we were, living in that fear of the unknown. And over time, she was doing great. She was healthy. You you couldn't tell by looking at someone with cystic fibrosis. Are you familiar with that? 
I am actually yeah I had friends a friend grow two friends actually who've had it yeah who okay who's still alive and one who died yeah okay well so she continued to grow and do well and everything and then when she turned 15 she went to the hospital for the first time and the protocol is to give them IV antibiotics and so that really um hurts the gut you know and it destroys the gut bacteria and then that's the home of the immune system and so I noticed that after that she continued to go into the hospital more frequently so she went in the next year when she was 16 and then the next year when she was 17 she went in a couple times and and so it just increased and it affected her ability to fight off infection and so forth so um it, there's a lot there's a lot of story there's a lot more story to this um I ended up divorcing when she was 2 years old and and it was a really painful, bitter divorce. I wanted out. It was, it was more emotionally abusive and mentally abusive than anything. He was 12 years older um, than me. And, and he was an authority for me, like an authority figure because he had been my teacher. He'd been my high school English teacher. And, and, you know, again, it's a convoluted, complicated story. And, and so when I wanted out of the marriage, I actually um, asked for joint custody and he refused, like he said over my dead body, basically. And, and I did not have the courage and the confidence to fight for her at the time. And because I thought, well, I'm the one wanting out. So I felt guilty. I felt ashamed that I'm the one wanting to end this relationship. And so I ended up giving him custody. He swore we could, he wanted us to have a relationship and that kind of thing. And so he didn't, it, it wasn't his truth. And so 30 days after the divorce was signed, he, he showed his true colors and he tried to use his authority to not let me see her as much as I wanted to, or as much as she wanted to. And I'm telling you this background because as you can see, it, it, it could create guilt for a mom. Like what's wrong with me? Like, am I a horrible mother? Like, how could I have given him custody? And, and so over the years, it took 11 years to be exact, 11 years later. And to make a long story short, she ended up moving in with me when she was 13. So she was two when we got divorced. She was 13 when she moved in and we, we did a lot of work to help her move in. Um, it was a lot of mental, emotional, you know, the tapping work, meditation, visualization, cause he wasn't going to budge. And I did hire an attorney to help advocate for us at the time. And so she finally got to move in when she was 13 years old. And you'd think we were so happy. But yet, shortly thereafter, she started having some more health issues with diabetes. She developed CF-induced diabetes, which complicates everything. And she started feeling really, really guilty because he was telling her, you're so selfish for leaving our family. He'd remarried a year later, had two boys, and and of course she loved her dad and she loved her family, but she wanted to be with her mom. You know, she was 13. And and so that guilt and all of that, you know, how we believe about ourselves. I mean, she felt like she deserved punishment for leaving. And and so, you know, when she was 15, she went into the hospital and so forth. And and, the, you know, I'm not trying to paint her dad as some horrible person. That's not what this is about. It's just that hurting people hurt others. And he was really hurt that she wanted to leave. And we as parents sometimes do silly things, you know, and, and that we don't have the best interest of the kid in mind. And so Maddie was always in that love triangle in the middle. He, you know, where he'd talk about us and we really tried not to talk about him, you know, and just say, let her make conclusions from our ex her experience of how we all relate. And, and so that's what we did. And unfortunately, what happened is that, you know, her CF just got worse and worse. While she was going through this, she was always, always seeking solutions, always trying to figure out, well, how can I heal this side? And she became the world's youngest healing code practitioner. I don't know if you've ever heard of the healing codes. Well, I have uh, now. Yeah. By Alex Floyd. They're super powerful. 
And she didn't like the tapping so much, but she, she really loved the healing codes. Um, and, and so I was a healing code practitioner and I turned her onto it and she just like, oh my God, there's something here. Like there's something really different about the healing codes than some other techniques like hypnosis. I'm a hypnotist. So I'd shown her all these things over time, Donna Eden energy medicine, you know, all these things, but she just took to the healing codes and, and it's not. I mean, it sounds like a, a sad, sad story. And the thing is like, she died when she was 22. So fast forward, um, we created a healing circle for her, which she loved power of eight. Have you ever heard of the book, the power of eight by Lynn McTaggart? Yeah. So we did a, a healing circle for her in August of 2018. And, and that was wonderful, but I want to pause Tara and just see if you have any comments, questions or. Well, first of all, um, you know, what I guess it's just coming to me how much loss and grief that you've, you know, you really know this subject mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, from a long way back. And I know that um, what I know what you're getting to because you had all of these difficult, complicated emotions as well as, you know, grief on top mm-hmm. of that. So to begin with, you know, I know that one after Maddie died, you started to really feel that you would never get over this. Right. Right. And a lot of people who will be listening will need yes. to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when the loss of a child, it did feel devastating. She was my only biological child. And and so there's that, well, I'll never have grandkids and I'll never have grandchildren. And I remember once her telling me, mommy, would you want to freeze my eggs? You know, and I'm like, Maddie, don't talk like that, you know? Um, but I kind of wish I had, you know, at this point, but so I have felt sorry for myself. I've gone through those, I don't know, the times of like, this isn't fair. Why is this happening? Um, you know, we did the healing circle and, and she loved that by the way. Um, it was, we had 12 people actually, it wasn't just eight. She picked 12 people. And, and every Saturday at four o'clock, we would do this healing circle for her. And she just felt so loved and supported and it was wonderful. And I, I I guess I started that because I thought this is like, this is going to help. This is really going to be the thing that helps her get out of this, you know, path. Mm -hmm. And, and so I remember it was in September um, and she joined one of the calls. She didn't always join the calls. Okay. She just knew it was happening. So she joined one of these calls and during the call, she said, I am at peace. I want for nothing. And I'm like, oh, don't say that. I mean, you, you would think you'd want her to be at peace, but, but yet that seems so final. And I remember she and I, when we first started the circle had created a list of the intentions of what we wanted to create for her. And one was like clear lungs, uh, clean digestion, the ability to have her energy back and to move because it affects the lungs and they get scar tissue and then you're not able to breathe. And so um, you don't have the same functionality if you can't get oxygen. And so the last phrase of the intention was Maddie is finally free. Now I had written a lot of this and then she put her stamp of approval on it. But I remember after she said that, I thought, Hmm, I went back to to the list and I wrote, she's Maddie's finally free in life. (laughs) I put in life, like, you know, and so that, that was, that was, I don't know. It was a beautiful September, you know, and that she was making peace. We had gotten an elephant tattoo, um, my with two a mom and a baby elephant with their trunks entwined um we got that in july and so and i you know i for the last year i was getting visions of well this is going to be the last time that we do this this is going to be her last birthday um or we went to the ocean in june and and i was holding her in the ocean and i thought this is going to be the last time i hold her and I was just getting those visions. And I mean, when I think of her, if I think of her too hard, I do, I feel, 
and I miss her. And I do still miss her and I'll always miss her every day. But that doesn't mean that my, just by having these emotions right now, it's good. It's not a, it's not a negative, right? I'm just tuning into her energy and it was beautiful, you know? And so I think we get afraid of our emotions and our feelings and that we've got to push them away. And I just show up authentically, you know, and, and real. And, um, so I was getting these flashes of this is going to be the last time. And in my mind, my ego was saying, Angie, that's ridiculous. Stop. You know, she's only 22. She's 22 years old and they live to an average of 39. Like this isn't it. You know, you're doing the healing circle and all of this. And, um, in September, that's my birthday month. So we were, we have, we always have a party at my mom's and out in the country in Illinois. And so we were out there and we do a little hayride down to, they have a cemetery at the end of my mom's long, mile long lane. And so we always do a little um, hayride. So we were doing our hayride and we went down to the end there and we were all sitting out. We turned the lights off because you could see the stars and everything. And, and there was only like, there's usually only about six of us that would do the hayride part. So we were all sitting there in the dark and Maddie's like, so now this was like September um, 22nd of 2018. And she said, so who do you think's going to die next? And no, we would usually tell scary stories, right? But this one hit too close to home. And so we, we were all just silent. Like no one said anything. And we knew it's like, well, you, you know, you, I mean, no one else here really has anything going. So, um, so she kind of knew, she kind of knew. And then it was right after that time that she said, I think it might've even been that day that she said, I'm at peace. I want for nothing. It was a Saturday. So, um, and then the next day was my birthday, the 23rd, and it was a beautiful Sunday. And we, we rode a four wheeler together and it was just beautiful. And, uh, you know, yeah, when I think back to those memories, it's hard to recall because it was so beautiful, you know, and and she sat on the back on the four wheeler and she had her arms around me. And, you know, I could just tell she was like saying goodbye, you know, because then October hit and then it, it sort of went from that beautiful September to this kind of hellish October. It really I mean, it felt very difficult in that we you would usually go to this craft fair in the beginning of October that was a long time tradition of hers that she loved and she wasn't able to, um, she'd just gone to the hospital. So we thought she was clean. She had a, you know, she'd be good for a few months, but what happened instead is within two weeks, she, she called me, she was at my mom's and she said, guess what, mommy? And I'm like, what? She's like, I'm not feeling well again. And I, I'm like, what? You just got out of the hospital. So, so then it, it just, yeah, I don't have time to go into all the details of that, but it, it, it wasn't good. I, we had to leave the Spoon River Drive craft fair, take her to the emergency room. And from there, she stayed for 12 days until she died. Mm -hmm. And um, we didn't, all the time, we didn't really know the severity of what was going on. I think I was just in denial about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of shock as well, you know. Yeah. Um, right. And yeah, I'm so sorry. Thank you. Thank you. And I know that you, um, as you mentioned, you know, that there was a, a, a period of feeling like, why me? You know, this isn't mm -hmm. fair. Um, right. Which is, I think, such an important part of grieving. Right, right. It and, is. Yeah, and that we don't, you know, yeah, we can try and make sense of things. And there's always that, you know, time for us to do that. But it's, but equally, you know, it's devastating and, and life for some reason is throws some of us more challenges, you know, than others. Right, right. Not to compare. No, no. I mean, everybody's grief is different. And so then, so then she died and, um, it, it, remember how I said in the beginning, I had that guilt and I, I had that guilt 
even though we were super close and we remained close all those time, all the 11 years that she lived primarily at her dad's, we remained very, very close because if someone tries to take someone away from you, what do you do? It makes you want them even more, right? So we were codependent. <laughs> Cheryl, we were codependent if you hear this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, she just, she had a wonderful life, I have to tell you. In 22 years, we traveled the world together. You know, we went to Australia, we went to Paris, you know, we went to Hawaii, we went all over the United States. And we just had so many fun, wonderful trips together. And even though she didn't live with me full time for those 11 years, that made us value that time even that much more. So every other weekend, I have a stepdaughter too. So when I got married to my husband, Steve, he had a daughter who was a year older than Maddie. They became best friends. And so, you know, we had this family unit and we traveled and we just had so many wonderful times. And so she packed a lot of life into that 22 years. And even up until, you know, that last year was harder. She's never been on oxygen or anything like that. So, it, and that's why it just felt like it went so fast in the end. But here's that, that healing circle. What I've had people say shortly thereafter she died was that that she's they didn't know anything about it. They they asked me they're they're like did something speed up her transition? <laughs> I'm like, hmm, yes, it was the healing circle because we were envisioning her having good health and a, a a new body and well the way to get that fastest I guess is to go to the other side. I I don't I don't know or pretend to know all the mysteries of life. But she has remained my Maddie Angel and just has inspired me. Um, have you ever heard of Teresa Caputo, no. the Long Island medium? She's a famous medium. And Maddie and I would watch her. And I remember a few months before Maddie died, she said, Mommy, would you, why don't you um, hire Teresa Caputo to talk to me when I'm gone? And I'm like, again, I said, Maddie, don't talk like that, you know? So, it took about six months after she had died and I was going to a network event and I met this woman who I had met years before and she was a medium and she came right up to me, you know, and she, and I told her about the Teresa Caputo thing. And she's like, well, um, I don't have a two-year waiting list and I'm a lot less expensive, <laughs> you know? So, so I actually hired her and I do a reading with her three times a year. It just happens to fall three times a year, um, May 2nd, September 2nd, and January 2nd. It just happened to be four months apart, exactly. So I I still have readings with her and communicate with Maddie in that way and and also communicate with Maddie every day, you know? And so, because we don't need a medium to do that, I don't believe, but it's just kind of fun. It's fun. <laughs> so. Oh, I love that you have that connection with her. Um, yeah. It really is. It's positive. It is. It is. And very comforting. Um, it is very healing. Yeah. I think it's always amazing how this is, and I speak personally, how I can forget so easily that my parents are here on a spiritual plane and that they are guiding me, but I don't often tune into them enough. And, and there's something just about having a reading you know, obviously they get such clear messages um, right. having a right. with them. So it's just, yes. yeah. So that was, that, that's great. And I, I just having that, that after six months, I was pretty upset the first six months. I mean, just, they say it takes about six months for the mind to adjust, you know, uh, and, and that doing that call with Catherine um, really, really, really helped me. Um, I remember I was um, sitting out in a hammock and it was about six months after. And I think it was right before I talked with Catherine and I said, well, Maddie, if you can really, if you're here, just give me a sign, you know? And so I'm laying there and it was a beautiful spring day. It was her birthday was April 18th. And so um, all of a sudden, like at first I didn't hear it, but then all of a sudden these wind chimes that someone had given me that say Maddie Jo Reynolds on there. Um, they were her for her in honor of her. 
they just started just going all over the place. Now I had only put them up like a few days before. So I wasn't used to them being there, but these wind chimes just started going crazy. There was no wind. That's what was so weird about it. There was no wind. Everything was still as could be. And these went, and then I, and then I saw, and I looked up and I'm going, Oh oh my gosh, (laughs) that's a sign. And so, um, you know, I, it's, it's the strangest thing on certain days. Um, like those chimes will just start going with no wind. And I've even recorded it because I'm like, I'm not crazy. This is what's going on. And my dog Mars, who I'm looking at right now, uh, he also like is in tune with her. They knew each other for years. And so he'll go into her bedroom and just lay up in her bed. Like he, he loves going in there. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, Am I looking for reasons to believe she still exists? Perhaps, but it's, it's my story, right? <laughs> I get to perceive it how I want. And, and that's how I choose to perceive it because wow. it serves. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Now I know when you emailed me, you talked about um, our issues are brought about by the issues of our heart. Right. Right. Um, I thought that was very interesting, you know, so what, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So I get that from a guy named Alex Lloyd and that's just how he termed it issues of the heart. And so he's got this book called the healing code. If anyone wants to check it out and it's the ones that Maddie did that I do and, and what his research shows, because have you ever heard of a heart rate variability test? HRV test. It's supposed to be like the gold standard of testing someone's stress levels, Mm -hmm. you know, so it's approved against medical models and everybody it's, it's well-known. So he did all this heart rate variability testing to see how people react in various situations. And with setting goals, for example, we get more stress when we set goals. Uh, But what he found is that every single issue that we have physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, like it's all brought about by issues of the heart. So those are deep issues that a lot of times we can call it hidden grief that we don't even know exists, but it's there and it's in the cellular memories. It's in the destructive cellular cellular memories of our body where trauma is stored. And so when I say issues of the heart, I mean those deeper subconscious, aka heart issues. So I, I equate the subconscious with the heart mm-hmm. and, and until we can change, cause the, the, the mind thinks in terms of images, all images, until we can change those images, then we're going to keep bumping up against things that are not in our best interest. And it could be addictive patterns, you know, relationship issues or traumas. It could be having a business and not having the courage to put ourselves out there and be visible, you know, like roadblock after roadblock after roadblock of financial struggles, you know, so those blocks that we don't get, like we're smarter. We may think we're smarter than that guy. Why are they so successful? And it's, it's always an issue of the heart that needs to be healed. Yeah. So that's what I meant by that. And I had an issue of the heart, many of them, And one of them was that grief of the other shoe is going to drop. I can't trust the process of life because the other shoe is going to drop. I'm going to get blindsided. I'm going to get hurt, rejected, abandoned. And, and so there's a, it's an invisible aura of sorts. I think ever since my auntie Lane and having a traumatic childhood as well, abuse, my dad to my mom, that kind of thing. And and really getting to heal that within me, I've healed the relationship with my dad, um, which was huge and truly not, not just lip service, but truly heart instead of head healing forgiveness. Um, so yeah, destructive cellular images. That's like, that's the name of the game. But when we, when we heal that, everything starts to change. That is so interesting. So is so the name of the guy is Alex Lloyd. Alex Lloyd, L O Y D. So the um issues of the heart is is he the same as the healing codes? Yes. Yes, he wrote the book The Healing Code. Okay. So um I know that this is a modality that you 
use in your yes now with clients I do I do and I, I'm actually rereading the book because mm-hmm. I got I think I read it back in 2013 for the first time 10 years ago and I'm rereading it because I'm remembering like how powerful these are and I've been giving healing codes over the years because you can do customized I can do customized healing codes for people but I do a free I just started this because one of the people at the healing code, cause I'm on a call, like a coaching call every month was saying, you guys should start a healing circle. So I decided there was, I, again, a little story. Do we have any time left, Tara? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So one of the traditions with me and Maddie and my daughter, Chelsea, who lives in Boston and she moved to Boston. Um, we would have at Christmas time, we would have a cookie party. <laughs> now we've been doing this since they were little girls. Like I love to bake and cook and stuff. And, and so we would, I would bake the cutouts and, and all these girls would come over and decorate them and help me. It was fun, you know? And so even after, you know, Maddie's gone, Chelsea's in Boston, like their friends still come over and, and we'll decorate cookies. And I just love that youthful energy around the house. You know, I don't have that very much. So we were doing that this past December. And so one of the girls brought a friend, a guy who's a guy. Now, usually we did have guys over the years come to, but mostly it was girls. So this this is an 18 year old boy. And he was talking. I had never met him before, but, you know, he started to feel comfortable in our small little group and like he could share things. And so he started sharing about how he had a a difficult childhood, a difficult family life currently, and that he'd had thoughts of suicide. I mean, he came in really shy that day and he just kind of opened up and started sharing all this. And I thought we need something like I need to create this healing circle because people are suffering. They don't want to talk about it. It's taboo to have vulnerable feelings. We got to be strong and have it all together. And so it was my impetus, my catalyst to say, okay, it's time to create this healing circle. And so during this healing circle, which is free, it will always be free. And I give three healing codes. And so it's based off of, and if you look at the book, the healing code, Alex talks about there's 12 categories, 12 categories of human suffering that if you look at these 12 categories, it covers the gamut of all human suffering. So the first month was on forgiveness or unforgiveness of the heart. So we did that February 7th. Then um, the next, it's always the first Tuesday of the month. We were going to do harmful actions next in just a few days. Um, I don't know when this will, well, it'll be after that, but that's okay. It's the first Tuesday of the month. And and if they can't make it, because I know we have a time difference here in the United States versus there, they can register and get the recording. So I'll send out the recording the next day. And, and then I give a healing code to go. So like when in between the calls, they can do this healing code. They will start to heal. And I mean, it's amazing. The physical issues that get healed from this, the mental, the emotional, the spiritual, like it runs holistically. It's just incredible what can be healed if we're ready because the ego mind that, that guard dog to the subconscious, you know, the ego man, it doesn't want us to change. The ego doesn't want us to change. And then the parts within us that they are protecting us from further pain, we they're, they're called the saboteurs. Some people call it the saboteurs. It's not, I'm not saying they're bad, but they do keep our hand on the hot stove. You know, it's like they keep our hand there and, and, and we're addicted to our suffering. You know, I mean, we are, I have been, I'm not, you know, I'm not just excluding me but we are all addicted to our pain and our suffering and we think it's normal and our mind is wired for suffering, not happiness. It's wired for negativity. And so it takes a huge effort to shift to saying, I am lovable. I am worthy and really feeling that in our heart. Mm. And, and that, and, and Tara, I'm 53 and I'm just starting to actually feel in my heart that I am lovable and I'm loving, I'm loved, and that I am worthy of creating a different experience other than suffering. It's yeah. Time. Am I a slow learner? <laughs> no, I mean, I was just sort of like laughing a little bit only because for me, myself, like you're saying, we're like addicted to the pain and the suffering and 
we it's our egos want to hold on to these stories and I just feel like personally right now I'm in that particularly yeah. when it comes to relationship you know that's yes a big area for yes. me so um and then you're like well do I want to change and you know it's anyway yeah because we're protecting our heart I mean that's that's what we do and when I lost Maddie it was weird because I was in a network group called, well, I don't have to say what it, I don't want to hurt anything, but I was in this network group that I had been in for three years with my stepdaughter. She was, and she became the president on October one. And I became the vice president of that group. And, and then October 26, 26 days later, Maddie dies. We became the new leadership. And then 26 days later, 26 days later, Maddie died. And people freak out when they don't know how to handle that. A lot of times I told the group, we went back about three weeks after Maddie died. And I said, Hey guys, I know this is awkward. And I want you to know that you can talk to me about Maddie. I like to talk to, about her. I like to hear her name and it, it's not going to be weird for me. So please know that I'm safe, that I, you know, I can handle that. And, um, and Chelsea was also open to talking, you know, my daughter, Chelsea, and about a hand, there was like 25 people in our group. A few of them felt real comfortable with this deep connection type thing. And that was great. But a lot of them, they couldn't even look at me. Mm-hmm. They couldn't look at me. And, and again, this is a long story. I'm going to brief. I'm going to just cut it down to the chase. I was actually asked to step down as the VP within because I was actually enforcing the rules that they wanted me to enforce. It was crazy. And I didn't do it meanly. I I asked for guidance. I'm like, we have 13 of the members of our 25 who are late with attendance. What, what do you want me to do about that? So they said, just send an email, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. But I followed their guidelines and one person complained about it. And that, you know, how it can create kind of a venom in the group. Well, that person actually ended up leaving, which was a good thing. And then, but then this, I was asked to step down and it just felt so unfair. Like I'm a CPA. I know how to manage things, you know, and I, and I know how to do it with kindness. You know, I'm not being unreasonable or untactful or anything like that. So it just felt incredibly unfair in a time when I needed my support. You know, and so, so that's the thing about grief, grief, when we're grieving subconsciously, there was almost a sign on me saying, this is going to sound crazy, Tara, but like abuse me, Mm, you know, it wasn't conscious. I didn't want this consciously at all. Subconsciously stuff was happening like that, that felt like terrible. You know, I felt so supported at first, but then afterwards I didn't. It's just funny because the TV is. Going, I know. I just start. I just. <laughs> it's going to like, off. Maybe Maddie's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 But it was a sign. It was a gift because I ended up leaving there. They weren't my tribe. And I ended up finding another network group about a year later that is my tribe. So even then, I knew like there's a gift here. I don't have to play the victim, I don't have to be the victim anymore. I mean, it's taken me, it's been four years, you know, but I can tell you honestly now that like I, oh, I have so much to say. So I read this grief recovery handbook. This was like last fall and in it, this is what kind of shifted for me. Um, The guy said, and I, I can't remember his name right now, but he said a few pages in, he started talking about if you've lost a child, right? And he said that it's a real common thing if you've lost a child, everybody supports you with it, that you will be permanently heartbroken, you know? And I'm like, okay, tell me, what are you going to say here? So he was talking to some woman in this grief support group and she was relaying how I lost my child. I'm permanently heartbroken. And that's a really touchy subject, right? And so he just said, he, instead of, he's not going to debate it, but he asked her, well, do you ever feel happy or joyful or do you have good positive memories of her? 
And she said, well, yeah. He, he said, do you feel like you're heartbroken in those moments? Something to this is, I'm just recapping a bit. And she said, no. And he's like, well, I know a lot of people would support this notion that you'll be permanently heartbroken. Do you feel that's really how you want to feel? You know, and the conclusion is that it gave me permission to say, I don't have to be permanently heartbroken because I lost Maddie and neither does anyone else when they lose someone. Um, I can separate out all that guilt and that shame that was surrounding her death because I didn't feel like it was a good enough mom. I can split that off from that because that complicates grief. And I can realize that we had a great life. We lived a lot of life in that 22 years. And I am not a victim to this life. You know, I am actually um, grateful. I'm grateful for, for that connection and everything and separate out the guilt and shame. And then realize also that I honor Maddie by healing my heart, by healing the issues of my heart. I'm honoring her and I will never, ever forget her. Mm. Mm. That's a distinction with grief. You never forget, but that doesn't mean you're heartbroken. You can still live. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can still, as you have been on this interview, vulnerable and, you know, and still sad that she's not here. That's right. That's right. And have the whole range. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I invited Maddie along on the, on the interview. I'm like, Maddie, come, come join me and just like, you know, lift this up and elevate. And, and so I can definitely feel her here. <laughs> yeah, and it's so interesting because behind you is like a, you're like a flame. Like a... That's true. And I've got this little thing here. Um, It's got her ashes in it. Oh. Have you seen necklaces like this? I haven't seen it's one. an elephant. So the top unscrews and it, you can put ashes in there. So <laughs> thank you for showing us that. Um, the last question I, I like to ask people is um, what is your interpretation of the term conscious grief? Yeah, I think, I think it's taking the guilt and shame, unraveling that, un, unentangling that from our story, like we have a story about when someone dies that we didn't do enough, the woulda, coulda, shouldas and all of that. So untangling that first and then realizing that it's okay to move forward. It's okay to actually be happy and smile because it took me a while to say, when someone say, how are you doing? I couldn't say I'm good. I said, I'm okay. So untangling the guilt and the shame and then giving ourselves permission to actually live again because that honors them. That honors them. It doesn't do anything else. I have parents that I've witnessed that have lost their children, friends. They won't talk to me. They won't even get on the phone, you know? And so they're still in denial. They're still in something that, you know, that they, they don't believe they deserve to be happy again. So conscious grief is un un unentangling all that, if that makes sense. That makes sense. And let's just talk about, again about your healing circle so people yeah. understand that um, we're going to have a link underneath this um, interview for you to yes. go and register and join. Oh, is that your dog? <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it a golden doodle? I mean, a, is it a golden doodle? It's actually a toy poodle. Yeah. <gasps> this is Kenny. Oh, Kenny? <laughs> so cute. Actually, Kenny Rogers. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> oh um yeah so please um register that that's a free event that you're gonna yes. be yes and then this healing codes i'm gonna buy yeah. that it's really yeah nice. and you can i'll do the healing codes every month on each of those 12 issues so it's it's just a fantastic way to heal from grief yeah yeah thank you so much this has been such a great welcome Tara just love meeting you so hope everybody enjoyed listening and yeah look forward to keeping in touch thank you thank you bye everybody